More trees join the millions already felled in the Amazon rainforest. Does it matter? I mean, after all, the rainforest in the Amazon basin is the largest on Earth. There are billions of trees in the forest. It is the richest ecosystem on Earth. This ecosystem contains around 50% of all the species of plants and animals in the world. It is the oldest ecosystem on Earth, according to some scientists, more than 100 million years old. It has survived Earth movements, drifting continents, ice ages, so why worry about it? We worry about it because forest like this can become wasteland like this in a matter of months. And no one knows whether it will recover. Vast areas of trees have already been cleared, but only now are we beginning to understand how the forest works. We're going to look at the conditions which exist in the rainforest that make it so unique and such an important environment. The Amazon rainforest stretches from the east coast of Brazil to the foothills of the Andes in Peru. The forest area is nearly 8 million square kilometres. That's 30 times the size of Great Britain. From the air, it's a never-ending mass of trees. You could fly over the forest like this for hours. Seen from the rivers, it's a jungle, a chaotic tangle of life. but there is a degree of order. Here we're 35 metres above the forest floor. We are looking out over the treetops. This is a canopy and you see a few tall trees standing out above the canopy. Some of these are 50 metres tall. Lower the camera and we pass through the canopy layer itself. The branches of trees 30 metres tall. Lower still, and we enter the under canopy, the branches of young trees waiting to break through into the canopy. And nearer the ground, the shrub layer on the forest floor. So definite sections, shrub layer, under canopy, canopy, and emergent trees. We can see it better in a model forest. The emergent trees, the canopy, the under canopy, and the shrub layer. The question is, why is the forest structured in this way? The answer is light. Light is one of the key factors determining the nature of the rainforest. 
all of the plants in the forest are involved in a life or death struggle for sunlight. The energy of the sun is needed for the process of photosynthesis. Once the canopy was formed, sunlight was almost completely shut out from the forest floor. Some plants have adapted to the dark. Some will catch the sun for only a few minutes of the day. Some make a dash for the canopy. Trees grow tall and straight towards the light. Others climb towards the sunlight. They cling onto the trees and they can be more than 100 metres long. If a tall tree should fall, there's a rush to take its place and break out into the light. But it's the canopy that captures most of the sun's energy. That's why it's the engine of the rainforest. It is here that the vegetation is most luxuriant. It is here that the flowers and fruit appear. And it is here that most of the animal life is found. By comparison, the forest floor is dark and quiet, and the wildlife difficult to spot. But there is a lot going on there. We'll find out more later. As well as light, plants need water and warmth, and there is no shortage of either. In fact, Amazonia is one of the wettest places on Earth. An average of 2,000 millimetres of rain falls here each year. It is also one of the hottest places on Earth. Why is there so much rain? This is the Amazon basin on the equator. The temperature rarely falls below 25 degrees Celsius. The high temperatures mean that the air over the basin is warm. Warm air tends to rise, creating an area of low pressure below. Moist air is drawn into this low pressure from the Atlantic Ocean, where pressure is higher, and it causes rain. But that doesn't explain this. Watch. This happens most days all over the rainforest. During the day, clouds build up, and in the afternoon, there is rain. What causes it? This is the basin, the air hot and full of moisture. As the sun gets higher in the sky, temperatures rise, and locally, the air begins to rise. As it rises, it cools and condensation takes place. Clouds form, rain falls. This is classic convectional rainfall, and it occurs all over the basin as the sun tracks towards the west. But there's something else. Most of the water that falls actually goes back up into the atmosphere. 
Some of the rainfall is intercepted by the trees and is held as moisture up in the canopy. It evaporates. The rain that reaches the forest floor is taken up by the roots and carried back to the canopy. Some escapes from the leaves in a process called transpiration. So as little as 20% of the rain escapes down the river. The rest is recycled. In fact, the water in this river may have fallen as rain as many as five times before it reaches the sea. High temperatures and heavy rainfall lead to high humidity in the forest. Conditions are ideal for plant growth, but the trees need something else. They need nutrients to grow, but surprisingly, they don't get them from the soil. This is a tin mine deep in the forest. The men are working 15 metres below what used to be the surface of the ground, and yet they have not reached solid rock. It's because the rocks here have been broken down over millions of years by the rain, heat and humidity. The weathered rock can reach depths of 15 to 20 metres, but it contains few minerals and few nutrients for plants. Look at the roots of this fallen tree. Why do you think they're so shallow? Living plants depend upon nutrients taken up from the soil. Soils in the Amazon basin seem to be deep, but they are poor because the nutrients have been washed out. So the trees send down only a few thin roots into weathered rock. The main root system is near the surface. The reason for this is that all the nutrients that the forest needs come from up above, from the forest itself. The forest appears evergreen, but most of the trees are in fact deciduous. They shed their leaves, but they shed them throughout the year, not all at the same time. It forms a thick litter of leaves on the forest floor. The leaves are seized upon by insects like these leaf cutter ants. They take them to their nests in the ground and digest them. Fallen trees or branches are attacked by termites. These are the first stages in the process of decomposition, during which the organic material of fallen leaves and wood is broken down. In fact, in conditions which can decompose rock, entire trees can quickly crumble away once they fall. All these processes make nutrients available to the growing trees. And the forest has evolved ways of capturing the nutrients before they get washed away by the heavy rain. Look again at the forest floor. It's a tangled mass of fibrous roots. In amongst the roots are fungi which help in the decomposition process. It's a highly efficient system which soaks up everything that's available and feeds the trees. Other plants in the forest have their own ways of getting the essentials of life. Some plants grow halfway up big trees, rooting in crevices where rain and leaves collect. Other plants are parasites. They take food from the host tree.
while others send out long roots from up above which can take in moisture from the air. The forest is not the same everywhere. Here we're in what's known as the flooded forest. The trees have adapted to being submerged for part of the year. The incredible diversity of life in the Amazon rainforest exists because the plants and animals there have devised so many ingenious ways to get their share of the essentials of life. In fact, the rainforest depends on two almost closed systems. A nutrient cycle where leaves, branches and trees fall to the forest floor, decompose and then the nutrients they provide are taken up by the trees to provide new growth. And a water cycle. Rain falls, some evaporates from the leaves, the rest falls to the forest floor, some runs off into rivers, the rest soaks into the soil and is taken up by the trees. Some of the water is given out through the leaves. It's another continuous cycle. Cut down the trees and you break these cycles. This is what's already happened in large areas of Amazonia. Rain is no longer intercepted and held in the forest. It strikes the surface of the ground direct. The nutrient-rich humus layer of soil is washed away. All that remains is poor rock debris, leached of its nutrients. Useless earth. The question for future generations is, could the entire rainforest end up like that? The unit is available on video, price $19.99. The study guide at $4.95 includes background information and detailed activities for those studying the equatorial rainforest. To buy these items by credit card, please telephone 01926 436 444 or write, making checks payable to Channel 4 Schools. <laughs> Time to stop, look and listen now on 4 with the Bible story of the first Christmas. This is a story that began a long time ago and a long way away. It's a story that hasn't really got an ending, but it starts with a young woman. Her name was Mary. She lived in a town called Nazareth in northern Israel. Before long, 
she was going to be married to a carpenter. He lived in Nazareth too, and his name was Joseph. Joseph and Mary seemed like ordinary people in an ordinary town. But one day, something very special happened, something that changed their lives and ours forever. On this special day, Mary was visited by an angel, a messenger from God. It was the angel Gabriel, and he spoke to her, Mary, you are going to have a baby. It's separated by a, a peninsula of land uh, and uh, some islands that help to pin the ice shelf. But well, its area is four times greater and it's exhibiting the same sort of characteristics that its neighbour Larson A did before it broke out. Ah. These penguins adrift on a berg can expect to see many more changes if, as many scientists predict, temperatures continue to rise travel deep into Antarctica and there's evidence that the Earth's weather has been very unstable in the past. Camped out on the ice are scientists with precise records of 160,000 years of the Earth's climate history. Trapped in the ice is evidence that our climate has undergone 10 degrees centigrade fluctuations in less than 50 years. Such changes predate modern human society but they serve as a warning. And we're moving into unknown territory as far as uh, the global climate is goes, we know that uh, even if it gets much warmer overall, that locally some places will get colder. Uh, we think there'll be a lot more storminess, for example, in certain places, more floods. Liz Morris has just finished a 63-day, 2,000-mile skidoo journey measuring recent ice temperatures. It is pioneering science. There's a whole, a whole mass of emotion, if you like, associated with, with the Antarctic. We've spent many hours in the, in the tent talking and discussing uh, Shackleton, Mawson, Scott. Um, it's all there, the tradition. Antarctica can also cause climate change. The blue meltwater lakes forming on its shrinking peninsular ice shelves are dramatic, but it's what happens here next that could severely disrupt global weather. Antarctica is connected to the ocean currents which flow from the North Atlantic up here down across the bottom of Africa, picking up cold water from the Antarctic. So the effects of Antarctica and its meltwater can be felt right up into the North Atlantic. Scientists fear that warmer waters here could disrupt the current, perhaps shifting the Gulf Stream that gives Britain its mild climate. The only certainty is that Antarctica is getting warmer. At more than 8,000 square miles, the Larsen B is by far the biggest Antarctic ice shelf to become critically unstable and break up. Further south, there are other ice shelves, some of them even bigger, which are also starting to disintegrate. Richard Wilson, BBC News, Antarctica. In the news tonight, there's to be a new judicial inquiry into Bloody Sunday, the day British soldiers shot dead 14 unarmed civilians after a protest march in Londonderry. News nights on BBC Two at 10.30, but that's all from the 9 o'clock news. Good night. On Question Time, actor and comedian Eddie Izzard shares the stage tonight with Transport Minister Gavin Strang, Conservative supporting lawyer Donald Finlay, also on the board of Glasgow Rangers, and Nicola Sturgeon, the Scottish Nationalist 27-year-old education spokeswoman. And our audience in Glasgow, of course, makes the running. Join us at 10.55. Good evening. The main stories from Look North tonight. The man accused of the manslaughter of six people in the Sorby Bridge lorry crash has been acquitted. The judge said that Eric Preston, the lorry owner's maintenance manager, could never receive a fair trial. But relatives of the six people who died say they feel badly let down. Having stood trial for the last 11 days, Eric Preston walked free this afternoon, acquitted by the court on six counts of manslaughter. The decision followed specific instructions from the judge, Mr Justice Hooper, who told the jury there was no case to answer. He said the prosecution had failed to secure vital evidence from the scene of the crash, and because of that, there was no guarantee Mr Preston would receive a fair trial. 
the feeling is sorrow. You know, I mean, six people have lost their lives, and that's, you know, I have nothing but sorrow for them. But. Today, though, for the victims' relatives, there was only disappointment. Outside the court, however, they supported recommendations by the judge to improve safety. There has to be an absolute rule on the wear on brake drums. I would also like to see an absolute rule brought in on the wear on brake pads, on the movement of the actuator, to make the lorries safer. A verdict of accidental death has been recorded on the death of a boy from York who's believed to be Britain's youngest solvent abuse victim. Today's inquest heard how seven-year-old Christopher Smith deliberately inhaled lethal fumes from tyre repair glue in August last year. A 15-year-old boy is being questioned by police after a woman was sexually assaulted in woods near her home in Castleford on Monday. She spent 14 hours outside in freezing temperatures before being found. The appeal by the Bradford paratrooper Lee Clegg against his conviction for murder has ended. Lance Corporal Clegg was found guilty of shooting teenager Karen Riley in Northern Ireland. Judgment on his appeal has been reserved for up to six weeks. Now, staff at one Bradford school could be excused for seeing double. That's because at Wedgwood Nursery, a fifth of its pupils are twins. But instead of double the trouble, staff say it's twice as nice to teach the youngsters. It takes two, baby, me and you. The odds are a million to one. In fact, you've got more chance of winning the lottery than of having five sets of twins in any one class. But for pupils at Wedgwood Nursery in Homewood, it's just something they take for granted. In fact, you could say it's second nature for these youngsters to find themselves sitting next to another child's double. And they sometimes think if you've got the same jumper on, you're a twin with somebody. They haven't quite picked up that it was born on the same day at the same time as the same mummy and daddy. With another set of twins hoping to join the class, Wedgwood Nursery could find itself in the record books. That's it from us tonight. Tune in to Look North tomorrow when we'll be at the opening of the new multi-million pound home of the Northern School of Contemporary Dance. Have a good evening. Good evening to you. Well, a word of caution first of all. If you're travelling tonight and first thing tomorrow morning, temperatures are falling pretty close to freezing already in some parts of the country and there'll be some freezing fog patches to watch out for too. The exception being the northern half of Scotland. Here there's too much cloud, there's some rain about as well and the breeze is a little bit stronger. In fact, if we look at the winds over the next few days, it's fairly benign at the moment, but you can see how the winds do become more of a feature once we get through to the beginning of next week. Much more boisterous winds coming in from the Arctic as well, so much colder winds, quite a wind chill factor developing by that time. But that's some way off at the moment. Things are quiet. We've got this large area of high pressure covering the country, but eventually come the end of Sunday, I think we'll see the first of those more active weather systems coming down from the north. That'll bring some snow showers, particularly to the mountains of Scotland in the second half of the weekend. Well, if you look at the radar, if you look very closely, you can see a little bit of rain about. There's been some quite wet weather up around Loch Glascarnock today. And you can see a finger of rain here moving across Orkney just now. We're going to find further patchy rain to come up there tonight. Temperatures staying a few degrees above freezing. But further south, that's a large part of the country, the clouds are going to be coming and going for much of the night, so do watch out for those thicker patches of fog and some ice on the roads and the pavements into tomorrow morning. Rather a grey start for many, those patches of rain coming down the eastern side of Scotland and down through eastern England as time goes by. Elsewhere it should begin to brighten up, the mist and fog slowly thinning out during the morning, some weak winter sunshine developing. Not a bad day for most, with temperatures around about where they ought to be, really, for this time of the year, 6 or 7 degrees. But actually, it was a bit milder than that today in some places. We did see double figures, 11 degrees at Leeds. I don't think we'll see anything like that tomorrow, near 7 degrees as the maximum for most parts of the country. Now, on Saturday, still some of that thick cloud down through eastern parts of Scotland into some central and eastern parts of England, too. The old spot of rain about, rather grey and uh, cheerless weather. Brighter as you go further west and similar sort of temperatures. Some weak sunshine after patchy overnight fog and frost. And here